a tiny archipelago nestled in the centre of the Mediterranean Sea. The Maltese Islands are a popular holiday destination, known for year-round sunshine, megalithic temples, fortified cities and crystal clear waters. But what is Malta like as a destination for wheelchair users? In this video, we'll show you what it's like to travel around Malta in a wheelchair. We'll be visiting the islands of Malta, Gozo and Camino, discovering what it's like to get around and finding out what you can do across the islands as a wheelchair user. The first thing to consider is how to get to Malta. You can either fly into Malta International Airport or you can arrive by boat. We chose to fly in and it's thumbs up for accessibility. The airport had all the facilities you would expect. The next thing to think about is where you want to stay. Since you can get to pretty much anywhere in less than two hours or one hour by car, being in a particular location wasn't a huge priority for us. So we just picked somewhere cheap. We stayed in the Parkview Apartments in Bujibar, which we found through our usual method, booking.com. We'll put a link in the description, but this accommodation is only partially accessible. You will need to be able to get up and down a small curb and also transfer into a bath, as there is no roll-in shower. The apartment is on the third floor, but it is all on one level and has lift access. Corridors and doorways within the apartment itself are all wide. However, the corridor between the main entrance and the lifts is quite narrow. Craig's wheelchair is 26 inches wide from pushroom to pushroom and he could only just fit down the corridor, so anything wider than that would be a struggle. Once you've decided how you'll get to Malta and where you want to stay, you'll need to work out how to get from place to place. When it comes to getting around Malta, you have a few choices. In terms of public transport, there are buses. This is what we chose and we'll come back to it in a moment. For the most flexibility, you could hire a car. From what we saw, disabled parking bays seemed common and most of the ones we saw were empty. They were very easy to spot as the whole bay was painted blue and had a wheelchair symbol on it. Taking taxis is another option if you don't fancy driving or using the buses. You can download an app called Bolt, which works in a very similar way to Uber. Use this code or follow the link in the description to get a free trip. Alternatively, you could go on a bus or coach trip. We saw lots of shops selling tickets for the hop on hop off buses. At 20 euro a day, they are a lot more expensive than the public buses, but they'll be quicker and more convenient than the public buses, so are probably worthwhile if you're pushed for time. If you're really up to it, you could even walk or roll from place to place. The whole island is only 27 kilometers or 17 miles end to end. We chose to use the bus because it was the most cost effective way to get around. You can buy single tickets on the bus for two euros a pop, or three euros at night, a seven day unlimited ticket for 21 euros, or 12 single journey tickets for 15 euros. All buses had a manual fold out ramp at the front, and the driver can lower the bus down closer to the ground to make the ramp less steep. This was fine when the ramp was placed onto a curb, but sometimes the bus would stop in the middle of the road and the ramp would be too steep to get up without assistance. All buses had a wheelchair seating area near the front, but be prepared that you might have to tell people already sitting there that you need that space, particularly parents with prams, as you have priority as a wheelchair user. While the bus was fine, we wouldn't recommend it unless you're bothered about costs, because we spent a lot of time traveling and waiting for the bus that you wouldn't have to waste with other methods of transport. The thing we struggled with the most in Malta was getting around the towns and cities themselves. Wheelchair access was very hit and miss, and pavements were extremely unpredictable. It varied a lot from town to town, as well as within different areas of a town. Some stretches had excellent access, while others were awful. One minute you would be on a nice, wide, smooth pavement, and then all of a sudden it would become very narrow and uneven. You never knew if you'd get a dropped curb or not. Some of the curbs were so high we had to retrace our steps a few times in order to find a lower point to get down. There's no, there's no drop curbs in this. In this. We can drop down, but then I'm going to have to go on the road. So I'm not getting back up again very easily. 
Luckily, the roads in most of the areas with bad footpaths tended to be quiet, so you could use them instead. On the most part, they were considerably smoother than the pavements. The other difficulty we found was the steepness of some of the roads. If you have a power attachment, bring it. And if you don't, bring someone who can give you a shove up the hills. Now that logistics are sorted, it's time to work out what you want to see and do. For such a small country, there is a surprisingly large amount of things to do. Whether you want a beach holiday, a city break, or to see historic sites, the Maltese islands have you covered. We spent four days in Malta and only saw a fraction of the things on offer. This is what we did and how we found wheelchair access. Our first stop was the former capital, Emdina, a walled city which is also known as the Silent City. The city is mostly car free, so you can wheel along the roads which are fairly smooth. Horse-drawn carriage tours were available if you want to and are able to get in them. If you're a Game of Thrones fan, we found exploring the old streets felt like we were wandering around King's Landing. If you are able to get upstairs, make sure you go to the top of the wall to see the great views across the island. As an ancient city, most of the shops and restaurants weren't accessible due to steps, but most of the attractions, such as the cathedral, did have ramps if you want to go in. We weren't really bothered about the lack of accessibility of the buildings, as the main attraction for us was just getting lost down the maze-like side streets. If you want to eat in Emdina, we only saw two accessible options. We tried out Fontanella Tea Garden, which wasn't bad, but their main appeal is their upper terrace, which boasts views across the island, and unfortunately, we couldn't get up there. If you are with someone able-bodied, make sure you send them into Fior de Latte to get you an ice cream, as this was the best we found in Malta. There were public toilets with a disabled toilet just outside the city gate that were free to use. Head to Gozo to take a step back in time. Imagine yourself in the Middle Ages wandering around the Citadella, or visit one of the world's oldest man-made structures. Gozo is easy to get to by ferry from Chirkawa. The Gozo Channel Line ferry runs 24-7 and departs every half an hour during the day. Wheelchair access onto the ferry was very easy via a lift in the terminal and then a ramp onto the ferry itself. You only need to buy tickets on the return journey back from Gozo to Malta and they're €4.65 Euros each. If you've been using the buses in Malta, the same bus cards can be used in Gozo. History lovers must visit the Gigantia temples. At around 5,600 years old, these megalithic temples were built before Stonehenge or the pyramids of Egypt and are thought to be some of the oldest man-made structures in the world. Wheelchair access was very good. There were ramps everywhere, but there was one rough patch of ground right outside the temples. This was fine for us with the freewheel, but otherwise it could have been tricky to navigate in a wheelchair. Entrance to the temples cost nine euros. The Citadella in Gozo's capital, Victoria, is another must-see. It is another one of Malta's ancient fortified cities. Be warned, the streets to and within the Citadel are very steep. Lift access is available to certain areas. There is a chairlift that will take you up onto the wall of the Citadel, but it is only available from 9 till 3, Monday to Saturday. There are great views across the island from the top of the city wall, but if you can't make it up there during that time period, there are other good accessible viewpoints, and the outer city wall is also accessible by ramp. Before heading back to Malta, stop in Emgar for some seafood. We enjoyed a fish platter in Bansini restaurant. Access was fairly good, but there was no disabled toilet. Valletta, Malta's capital, is another walled city. It is Europe's smallest capital city, and in fact the whole city is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Valletta was a mixed bag in terms of wheelchair accessibility. All the streets between the waterfront and the city centre are extremely steep, but the city centre itself is actually fairly flat. We entered the city from the bus terminal near the Triton Fountain and City Gate. If you enter from here, wheelchair access is good. The main streets were fairly smooth, and because a lot of it is pedestrianised, you don't have to worry about narrow or uneven pavements like you do in the rest of Malta. There is a lift which goes up to the top of the city wall, but unfortunately it was broken, so we couldn't go up and check it out. 
Head to the upper and lower Baraka Gardens for some great views over the three cities. From the upper Baraka Gardens there is a lift down to the harbour. It is free to take the lift down but you have to pay to come back up again. We took the lift down and then took a ferry across to the three cities which was accessible. It's normally one year is 50 but only 50 cents for wheelchair users. If you fancy transferring into an inaccessible boat, you could take a traditional water taxi across for two euros. We didn't have a huge amount of time to explore, so we focused on the city of Burgu. You can wheel along the smooth promenade and check out the super yachts in the marina, most of the way from the ferry stop to Fort St. Angelo. We stopped to eat in Don Berto, an upper floor restaurant with lift access. Dine outside on the balcony for some great views back over Valletta. We couldn't miss a trip to the famous Blue Lagoon, but Camino was by far our biggest challenge when it came to wheelchair access, and it started with getting there. You pretty much have two choices in terms of getting to Camino. You can take the Camino ferry from Chocua, which is what we took, or you can go on a boat tour. There are a lot of different companies offering boat tours, and most of them claim to be wheelchair accessible. If you want the easiest option, I would suggest taking one of these tours. We couldn't find any information about wheelchair access for the ferry online, so we decided to go and check it out and see what it was like. Return tickets were 13 euros, or slightly less if you bought them online. There was a ramp down to the harbour, but no direct wheelchair access to get on and off the boat. You'll need to either be able to do a wheelchair to boat transfer, or be prepared to let the crew lift you on and off. We'd had previous experience of doing a boat transfer, so the experience was relatively straightforward. However, we did manage to drop a shoe into the water. <laughs> so, someone dropped their shoe in the water yeah, while yeah. transferring uh, between the boat. You were in charge of the shoe. I was not. The ferry docks at the Blue Lagoon. Since we were visiting during the low season, we didn't expect it to be too busy, but it was absolutely teeming. The combination of rocks and swarms of people made wheelchair access extremely difficult. If you want to experience the Blue Lagoon, we would recommend taking an evening boat trip or staying overnight on the island as the crowds clear out once the ferries stop running. Okay. If you want to swim in a quieter spot, head to Santa Maria Bay on the other side of the island. The water isn't as blue, but the lack of people makes up for it. Camino is a small island, less than three kilometers long, and only has three permanent residents. There are a few sights to see, but Camino has no paved roads and is very rocky, so we'd recommend taking a jeep tour if you want to explore the island. Tickets for the jeep ride are five euros return. Though we stayed in Bujaba, we didn't spend much time there during the day. There was a long promenade all along the seafront. This was very wide and smooth and great to wheel along during the evening. We found a couple of good restaurants in Bujaba. Tal Piazza, had cheap pizza and we also tried the traditional Maltese rabbit stew there. In typical fashion, we got overexcited when our food came and demolished it before thinking about taking any videos, but it was pretty tasty and traditional, so go for it. If you're in Bujaba and you like sushi, we'd recommend Asian Kingdom. It is by no means Maltese, but if you want to make the most of unlimited sushi for a reasonable price, it's a good place. There are steps at the front entrance, but they have a side entrance through the hotel next door, which is accessible. We got an on-the-go lunch from a pastisseria most days. These were found pretty much everywhere in Malta and Gozo, and you could get pizza slices or traditional Maltese pasties for one to two euros. Malta is definitely not the easiest destination for wheelchair users, but that's part of the challenge that makes it fun to explore. We didn't always choose the most accessible way to do things because we're happy to just go with it and make it work if it's not accessible. So if you want a more wheelchair friendly experience than we had, it's definitely possible. If you're planning to visit, here are a few things you might find useful to know. Maltese and English are the main languages spoken in Malta. The time zone is Central European time or Central European summer time, depending on the time of year. Euros are used in Malta. Card payments were widely accepted, however, there were a few places that required cash. Malta uses Type G plug sockets, which are the same as the UK, and they're also one of the few other countries which drive on the left. You can drink the tap water in Malta, but it tastes bad, so most people don't. 
In terms of price, we'd say Malta was a mid-priced holiday destination. We paid about 25 euros per person per night for mid-range accommodation in shoulder season. Most sit-down meals in restaurants were about 6 to 25 euros, but they could be higher. Transport was fairly cheap in Malta. It cost 2 euros to take a bus to anywhere in the country. Entrance to most paid attractions seem to be in the 10 to 20 euro range. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it useful, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe and click the bell button to be notified when we release new videos. If you have any questions about Malta that you think we haven't covered, please leave a comment and we'll do our best to help. We've left links for everything useful in the description.